Would you pray with me? God, we thank you. We thank you that even in these times that we can sp still worship you, we thank you that we can still praise you, and just seek to learn more about you. God, help us in these days to not be discouraged. Help to encourage us and just help us to not grow tired of doing good and of looking after our neighbors. For those in our congregation who are sick or recovering from surgery, we pray that you be with them. Help them to heal. For the community and the world around us, God, we pray that you just walk with us all. God, in these times, we need you in your guidance. Forgive us, God, of the times in which we have hurt others. Forgive us for the times when we have not treated others as you have called us to treat them, when we have not loved and cared and helped those in need. Lord, forgive us and help us through the Holy Spirit learn to make right and to do right. Put us back on that path. And God, help us to be a people. A people even in a hard times who are still encouraged, guided by your love, and just surrounded with your creativity. God, as the weather changes and the leaves start to change with it, may we be reminded of your beauty and your love for us. And now, to end our time of prayer, I'd ask you if you would join with me in reciting the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We'll be singing the Church's One Foundation, number 350 in the hymnal. welcome you to worship. Whenever and wherever you are joining us, 
whether online or on our telecast a week later, it is good to have you here in worship. Our only announcement this week is that, as on me, my mind has left me. You'll remember two weeks ago that I said that we were going to do communion the following week. Well, I forgot, and so one week later, we'll be doing communion today. So if you want to go and while we're doing the introduction, uh, grab from your kitchen or you can pause the video. Um, if you have grape juice and bread on hand, that's great, but I'm sure even water and a cracker in these circumstances would be fine. If you wanna get those, we'll do those at the end of the service. But we are just simply glad to have you here in worship today. I hope you can join us. Please join us now for our time of worship together. We'll be singing Help Us Accept Each Other, number 754 in the Glory to God hymnal. It's hard sometimes being in a group. When I was in high school, I was a proud four-year participant in a Model UN. Actually, at both high schools I went to, I found the Model UN Club. If you're not familiar with Model UN, it is a week-long event where for a couple months beforehand, you get a country and you research this country, their positions, their attitudes about world events, and then you go to this event and you represent and play as this country. Like the UN, there are various delegations and subcommittees formed, and you try to pass resolutions facing a couple of selected problems that are presented to you. I imagine the point is to help people see outside the world around them to help them look at the world's problems and think through solutions. And, and to their credit, there were many times in Model UN where I saw that beauty, that group of people joining together, that feeling of working with others to make the world a better place. But of course, when any group gets together, especially the high achievers who would do Model UN, there's some not so pretty elements. It always amazed me that within a one day or maybe two, and we only had a week, how quickly factions would form. Different groups had different resolutions they wanted to put forward. Sabotage occurred, fierce battles at the podium, fighting. Pretty soon you knew who you liked and who you didn't like. Much like the real UN, when a group of people get together, 
sometimes things chafe a little bit, and there's some problems. We kind of talked about this last week. As we finished up the book of Philippians in the fourth chapter, Paul was addressing a church conflict. And after finishing Philippians, we're now going to hop into the book of Matthew, um, all the way up through Thanksgiving. And I thought what would be interesting, a good point for us to enter into Matthew's story, is to talk about a passage where Jesus was addressing a similar idea of conflict in a group of believers. Perhaps it's even what influenced Paul's writings. This passage comes from Matthew chapter 18. I'll be reading verses 15 through 20. Let me read them for you now. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If that member listens to you, you've regained that one. But if you're not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If their member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly, I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly, I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Now, Rather than just wanting to focus on conflict two weeks in a row, I actually was really drawn to this passage because I think, yes, Jesus is talking about conflict, but in a deeper sense, I believe in this text here in Matthew, Jesus wants to tell us something about the church, about this group of believers that we call home. The first step, I think, is understanding the context of this passage. Chapter 18, the chapter this is found in in Matthew, talks about a few things. It starts off talking about the idea of greatness, where Jesus says to the disciples that in order to be great, you must be like the children around me. In fact, Jesus goes on then to say a little later in verse 18 that if you are to mislead children or the little ones, then it is better if you had a millstone tied around your neck. This idea of protecting the vulnerable and the least in our community. Matthew chapter 18, right before our passage, then talks about the parable of the lost sheep, how The shepherd goes to seek the one out of the 99. This idea of finding and restoring and how important it is to the heart of Jesus. And then right after our passage, it then is forgiveness. Peter, questioning what Jesus says, says, how many times should I forgive? And Jesus says, 77, when Peter asked if seven was enough. He then goes on to tell a whole parable about a servant who was unforgiving and the harshness that servant receives. This passage, then, is wrapped in an important context. The context of this passage is one of forgiveness. One of valuing those who are lost. It's also a context that looks after the weak and the vulnerable. Context that I don't think was a mistake that Matthew put this story in the middle of. And and I start with context because I think with context we might lose focus. When I lived in England, I found out the British have a very different sense of humor than us Americans. 
It's not completely out there, but it's a little more dry. They like juxtapositions. Jokes that we might think are just a little odd are very funny to them. Case in point was a commercial for a popular sitcom that was on when I was over there. To advertise this sitcom, which was a comedy that featured doctors in a hospital, this commercial took out of context every serious moment from this sitcom. Over the many seasons, there were a couple of moments of sad times, and they showed them all together. After a minute and 30 seconds of seeing every single sad scene of the sitcom, the commercial said, lighten up, it's a comedy, and it's on at eight. Now again, as Americans, we might not find that funny, but to British, it was that juxtaposition, that funniness that if you took all these scenes out of context, what was a comedy 99% of the time could look like a drama or even a tragedy. Context is important. And when we lose sight of the context, we can lose sight of the meaning in the passage. This is an important passage. It is cited by many churches, and including ours, as how we should deal with conflict in the church. And I think that that's a good place for us to start. But out of context, when it's just taken here, this passage can become something that's used to enforce order, to keep people in line. Oftentimes it is used by the powerful to make sure that their way is the right way. We, we can see this passage as harsh and mean, as putting down, as limiting our freedom. But I think that is us missing the context. The context of this passage is in a section that hopefully I believe that Jesus, instead of wanting this to be a strict finger wag, instead was hoping for a community that looked after the weak and the vulnerable, that protected those from getting hurt, in fact was very upset as he was in that earlier passage with someone who might hurt someone. And so this is instead a passage for how we as a church stay together, treat each other right, love and care for each other. In context, I think this is not a stern disciplinarian of a passage, but instead a passage trying to create a beautiful image of a community, a community that takes its relationship so seriously that it's important enough to try to deal with those times in which we rub together. Because ultimately, that is where I believe this passage is going. It wants to invite us to think about a way of approaching each other with love. I'm not sure this passage was meant to be a one-for-one -one guideline for how every church conflict needs to be dealt with. I, I don't think Jesus was saying, this is the only way and we need to do these steps. But I do think Jesus was trying to introduce ideas of how we should approach each other. How in this church community and even dealing with others around us, what we can use to employ. So for example, the idea of going to someone one-on-one, -on -one, then going with a trusted person who might help that person, and then going to the church community, was this idea of a process a process in the very honor-shame culture that was there was meant to not punish this person, not embarrass them, but truly hope for the best. We might call this today a restorative instead of a punitive process. Something that's truly trying to help and speak to this person, giving them a chance to repent and to turn around. Also an important principle here is that you're encouraged to go to this person. This idea is that a community were a wrong, and that is something that's interesting about this passage. There's a clarity here that perhaps we don't often have in our world, where one person clearly is someone who has sinned against them. And so there is an idea that it needs to be addressed, talked about, in a community that can do that. It's the idea that it takes it seriously when someone has hurt someone else. And finally, the idea here is even 
that this person is important, even the one who has done the hurting. The one who has been hurt is important because they are speaking about this, but also their brother or sister is important too. (laughs) Their sibling in Christ needs to hear this. And even the ultimate example that this person would be sent away from the church and be treated as a tax collector and Gentile maybe is not as harsh as it sounds. Because in the rest of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus loved tax collectors and Gentiles. He ate with them. He talked with them. He gave them chances to come and to see and to join. And it's saying even if this person refuses to see this point that they're still is love and care. When I was engaged and about to be married, like many people, I did premarital courses with my wife, Liz, then fiancé. And one of the interesting things was I did not really know what to expect. From movies or something, I thought it would be wacky questions or intense counseling sessions. But in reality, a vast portion of it, of premarital and even of a lot of marital counseling, dealt with the idea of communication, of talking through problems. Classic questions would be asked, such as, how do each of your families celebrate birthdays? The idea being that if it's different, there's a chance to talk through that, to hear the other person, to express your own views, to listen, and to move forward. It sounds simple, but it's important that communication is seen as the bedrock of a good relationship. In a similar way, I believe that is what Jesus wants to do here. A communication, a communication that doesn't hide a true wrong done, doesn't also try to be punitive, but tries to help a church move forward. It's a beautiful image. And like I said, in the real world, it might not be as clear-cut. It might be a little messy. And again, that's why this necessarily should not be a one-to-one. Of course, there are cases, such as cases of abuse or misuse of power, where perhaps going one-to-one first is not an appropriate step, but instead proper measures need to be taken. Or again, for example, sometimes things can be out in there already, and so conversations involve more people. But again, I'm not sure this is a step, but instead this is an encouragement of Jesus. Jesus is saying that we need to be a community that has restoration, allows for forgiveness, and also takes wrongs seriously. It's a large task and a heavy picture, but it is one that I think comes from the idea that Jesus saw that this should be taken seriously. Because why is this so important? I think it is important to Jesus because Jesus saw the church, the gathering of believers, as important. That famous passage, one often quoted by me, where two or more gather in my name, I am there. It's a simple but powerful section of Scripture. Jesus is saying that when two or more come together, his presence is there. The presence of Christ on this earth can be experienced when we join together as believers. That is a wonderful thing. That's something worth trying to keep together. The presence of Jesus in our life is experienced when we are joined together. And and I think we see this in that kind of confusing section before, at least to us as Westerners, of this language of binding and loosing. It can be seen as odd, and scholars say we need to see some of the context of this in the time. Binding and loosing were probably more maybe legal terms. Uh, So there was not everything as the English language makes it seem, but perhaps a more specific focused nature of that. And also maybe instead of the idea of wild power, it was more of a responsibility. 
Someone gave an example of, say, a servant given a key to an owner's house. They open and close the door, but they know the house is something grander than them, and they have the responsibility of taking care of it. But all that aside, the thing is, is that Jesus sees this church community as something that is important, that has influence, that has an effect around it, and one that God is present in and helping and guiding. The group of believers matters. They matter to Jesus and it matters to us because it's one of the ways we see Christ in the world around us. C.S. Lewis, in his book called The Great Divorce, had an imaginary view of heaven and hell. Hell to C.S. Lewis was a place where everyone had the ability to build and imagine a house of their own. Except they would always get very frustrated and angry at their neighbors. So they would always move a little farther away, make a new house until they got frustrated again and move away. His then picture of hell is a people who are far away from God and move farther away from each other again and again and again. Now again, that's C.S. Lewis's imagination, but I think there's something to that. We as a people of heaven are called to be a community, a community that teaches us to love God and to love each other. And that love of God not only draws us closer to God in our lives, but draws us closer to each other. Now again, this is not always easy. This sometimes gets messy and complicated. And we are not always perfect. But I think the thing that should keep us involved, keep us coming back to some form, whether it's this expression or others, of the church, is because it is within the faith of each other that something special happens. It is joining together with each other that we feel the presence of Christ. And honestly, I think this season of COVID-19 has been a reminder to us all. When it comes down to it, church is not about the beautiful building. It's not about the wonderful hymns sung together, the great meals that we share. Those are all good, and those are gifts God has been given us, and we hope that we use them well. But we cannot think that those are church, right? Because church is us. And COVID-19 has taken from us for a season that ability to gather together in exactly the ways we want. While not perfect, and we hope we'll end at some time, the reason why we still seek to gather, gather whether over these sermons of a service that we watch, gather through our prayers, gather through our Zoom Sunday school and Bible studies, through our phone calls to each other, through our socially distanced time outdoors, it was because we know that there is something important. Church life, like I said, is complicated, it's messy, it sometimes is not the best. But I do think at those moments where it shines through, those moments of beauty, those moments of love, those moments of care for each other and the community around us, those moments that show us the presence of Christ, allow us to be Christ's hands and feet to the world around us, those are valuable and important. And those are what Jesus wants us to remember. So yeah, I hope you can see in this passage not just another example of conflict, but an encouragement. An encouragement that in your faith and in the faith of your brothers and sisters in this congregation and in the Christian community at large, that we are not only seeking to love God and love our neighbor, but to show Christ's presence to each other, to the world around us.
May we be reminded that the church is important. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you. I thank you that you allow us to worship with each other. I thank you for our fellow believers. I thank you, God, that you are present in our lives. God, help us. Help us seek to approach conflict in a way that is loving, caring, forgiving, taking the hurt of others seriously, and is in the spirit of how Christ calls us to be. Help us, God, in that sense, to be reminded, whether in conflict or not, of the importance of your gathering of believers. Sustain us, God, in these hard times, and allow us to learn more about you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. I, as I said, I apologize for getting about it last week, but this week I was hoping that we would have a time to take communion together. Communion is a reminder of our joint connection to Jesus Christ, that Christ's sacrifice to us has brought us closer to Christ and closer to each other. And in this time, communion is a reminder that you are not alone, but through Christ we are united. So would you join me now? In Corinthians, the Apostle Paul reminds us that on the night Christ was betrayed, he took the bread, whatever you have, he broke it, passed it around, and said, eat this in remembrance. This is my body broken for you. Eat this in remembrance. Now, collect the juice or water, what you have, and join with me whenever you are watching this, but know that you are joining with me and others. And know, as Paul continued to say, that on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took a cup and said, this is the blood of my covenant poured out for you. Whenever you drink, drink in remembrance of me. So know that whenever you drink, whenever you eat this communion, know that we are doing it in remembrance of Jesus Christ, how it joins us together. May you remember in these times that Christ is with you and that Christ is, goes alongside you. Amen. We'll be singing, Draw Us in the Spirit's Tether number 529 in the Glory to God hymnal.
want to leave you with this good word. Even in these hard times, may you be reminded of the presence of Christ and the love of your fellow believers. Let's go now in peace. Amen.